Well, I love that verse because it speaks of uh, us being a people who are waiting eagerly for the appearing of the Lord. I don't know about you, but particularly in the days and times we find ourselves in, I find myself waiting a little more eagerly these days. I don't know about you. Um, and I think it's an appropriate passage to read this morning because we're going to uh, look at a first century church that was told to do the same. A first century church, the church of Corinth, was told to wait eagerly for the appearing of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which means every church of every generation is to wait eagerly for the appearing of Jesus Christ. Um, we started a study, a verse-by-verse -verse study uh, of Paul's letter to the Corinthians way back in April, um, and we did 12 weeks of studying and went through the first four chapters, and then in July, we took a break and decided to uh, look uh, and focus in on the Lord's second coming from his own words in Matthew 24. So we did an eight-week study there. And then last week, we joined uh, you here and were uh, under Pastor Bill's teaching. So, so this week, I thought we'd, we'd return to our study of 1 Corinthians, but then I thought about it. Our church has been out of it for 10 weeks, and, and you have not been able to be involved in that teaching with us. And I thought, well, we certainly don't want to just jump into chapter 5 out of nowhere when Paul starts talking about the sexual immorality in the church. <laughs> so I thought, why don't we do this? We were, we're going to do something different today. I'm going to do a walkthrough, a review of the first four chapters of Paul's letter to the Corinthians. So you can turn in your Bibles today. This is going to be a little bit different than I normally do things. Usually we go verse by verse right through a book, but um, this will help us just really uh, get all on the same page. It's going to be important for us, I think, to know uh, really why Paul is writing this letter. Who's he writing it uh, to? And give us a little background on this. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. And as you're turning there, I should uh, just uh, tell you that this is not a doctrinal letter per se. It is a corrective. It's a corrective letter in nature uh, because the church in Corinth was really beginning to look more like the world than like Christ. Um, and so Paul is going to address these things, but with, with all of us, wrong living always stems from wrong belief in some way. So he will uh, go into doctrinal things that relate to sin and righteousness and whatnot. Um, and so I, I came up with a title for this, and Bill, you said you like titles. I like titles as, as well. And my title for the whole study is Live Up to Your Calling. And it comes straight out of verse 2. If you want to look at that with me in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, verse 2. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Called to be saints. Paul calls this body of believers uh, saints. I don't know what conjures up in your mind when you think of the word saint. Perhaps you think of uh, those few individuals from, from history that have been venerated to sort of this, uh, I don't know, heavenly status by the catholic church or the anglican church certainly we are aware of the patron saint of wales here saint david uh, a patron saint is uh, really looked at as a heavenly protector a heavenly advocate of a people or a nation or a tribe um, and that may be what you picture that is not what the biblical term saint is um, we get the definition of saint right from here in 1 Corinthians. And really what's remarkable about the fact that Paul is using this about the Corinthian church is because they, they were a mess. They, they were doing just about everything wrong. Everything they were doing needed correction. In fact, it wasn't just their conduct and their service, but it was even their, their motives behind those things that needed some correction. Now, I like to take a look at the word saint in the Greek there. It's hagios, and here's what the word means. Holy ones holy ones now this is interesting to think of the corinthian church as holy ones how can they be holy if they're doing so many things wrong what you have to understand is that this speaks of their position in christ your position in christ we have to remember that the difference um, is between where christ sees us our position and our practice there's a big difference and um, how, how I relate this is, you know, I was saved, I was baptized when I was uh, 10 years old or so, so uh, positionally I was made holy. That is how uh, God looked upon me. But I did not make my practice as a believer match my position probably into my 30s, sad to say. 
Positionally, God sees us as holy because we have the righteousness of Christ, right? That has been imputed to our account. Sin was imputed to Christ. That's the great substitutionary atonement of 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Christ, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, right? That is the whole transfer that took place. So we're positionally holy. And this Corinthian church was holy. They had been made holy. They were saints. But they had yet uh, made their lives match their position. So Paul exhorts them to live up to your calling. And that's really where the title comes from. And I just want you to draw your attention to the very first chapter to begin with. Paul uh, introduces himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God in verse 1 there. And all of 13 of Paul's letters, he introduces himself that way. Paul, an apostle of uh, Jesus Christ. Um, And it's a very important thing to understand as we introduce this letter, because this letter is corrective in nature, as I said. It's going to be, uh, uh, he's going to be talking about proper function, proper motivation for the church, um, which is going to be rooted in doctrine. He's going to challenge them to live up to their calling as saints. And if he's going to do those things, he has to establish his authority right, to be able to address those uh, things. But here's the thing, he's not one of the 12, is he, right? You remember when uh, Judas hung himself, you have 11 remaining disciples, and they cast lots, and they elect Matthias as the 12th, not Paul. So he's not one of these renowned 12 disciples, and so when he writes his letter, he has to sort of establish his authority. How does he do that? He says, how was he made an apostle? It wasn't through the choosing by the 12, it wasn't through casting the lots, it was what? by the will of God. And that's what he does in all of his letters. He is an apostle, and that was God's will to make him such. He was appointed by God himself. And so here's his authority to teach on these uh, things. Now, just a quick introduction about Corinth itself. Uh, It was uh, held by the Macedonians way back in 196 BC. It was conquered by the Romans, uh, uh, Julius Caesar. Uh, Then it became a Roman colony, and, and Augustus Caesar really was the one that came in and established it as a, as a capital city of the province of Achaia. So you know how they have the different Roman provinces. It is the capital city of that. And it became a really a great commercial center um, in Greece there. It had a population of 400,000. So it's a thriving, prosperous city. And the reason for it is because of its strategic location. You should look at the map here. You can see where Corinth is there. And you can see it's on this little Peloponnese, this little land of, uh, called Peloponnese, and there's a tiny little strip of land that connects it to the main part of the land called an isthmus. And uh, traders would, would sail into that land, they would disembark, pull their boat up onto the land, roll it across on logs to the other side, and continue sailing on through the Aegean Sea. So they were in a very strategic location where um, they could uh, really prosper from all the trading going on. So they were wealthy, they were, uh, lived in luxury, and it was notorious for that, but it was also notorious for something else. It's gross immorality. This was a pagan city. So much so that the Greek word Corinthias estai a meant to become like a, a Corinthian. If you use that word, just, oh, you're acting like a Corinthian, which came to really represent gross immorality, drunken debauchery. In fact, the whole place really wa- it was filled with moral, great moral depravity. It had an acropolis, which is the Greek word for a high place, but it was a high granite, 2,000-foot granite mound that they had built a a defense area up on top of, Acro-Corinth up there. But they also built a temple up there to the goddess of love, Aphrodite. And it housed 1,000 temple prostitutes that would come down in the evening to ply their trays. So you're talking about a very uh, evil city, um, great gross immorality taking place. And in chapter 6, Paul says to the church, and such were some of you. So this church is born out of that kind of a pagan culture. When did that start? That started in Paul's second missionary journey. You can read about it. We're not going to go through it today in Acts chapter 16 through 18. Verse 18 actually is where, chapter 18 is where he, it comes into Corinth, and you can read about that. And just to, to recap, if you remember, he comes in there and he meets Aquila and Priscilla. He leads them to, to the Lord, and they kind of start the church. He goes into the synagogue Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, is, is, uh, becomes a believer. Uh, later on, Sothenes is, is, is replaced by, uh, he replaces Crispus, but the Greeks beat him all up over the turmoil over, over Paul. And what's interesting in verse 1 is you notice Sosthenes is mentioned. This is not just penned by uh, Paul. It's, 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 it's penned by Paul, but it, he has a pen men, an amenuensis, and it's Sosthenes. And what's amazing is because Sosthenes was from the Corinthian culture. He's adding his voice to this letter because he knew the the situation in Corinth was dire. 
In chapter 19, when you're reading through Acts, um, um, Paul, well, you find right before that, Paul, Paul goes to Ephesus. He goes to Ephesus, which is across the Aegean Sea. He takes Aquila and Priscilla. And this guy named Apollos comes along, and he meets Aquila and Priscilla. And Paul heads back on home to, to complete his journey. Aquila and Priscilla tell him about Corinth. He goes back over, and Apollos becomes the second pastor of the church in Corinth. Paul begins his third missionary journey. He ends up back in Ephesus. So they're just across the Aegean Sea from one another, okay? Apollos in Corinth, and Paul in Ephesus. And so he's, he, there, that, that's where we really come to this letter. And as he's there, um, Paul gets word that there are issues in the ter- church. Um, sometime along the way, Paul writes a letter to the, the church in Corinth. We don't have that letter. It's called the lost letter. So this is 1 Corinthians, but it's not the first letter to the Corinthians. There was an earlier letter called the lost letter. You might be saying, well, how do we know it's the lost letter? It's lost. <laughs> We know from chapter 5, when you read chapter 5, verse 9, if you want to look at it, he says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people, yet I certainly do not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you, so now I'm writing to you again, uh, to not keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. Now, he goes through this whole list, and it really highlights the problem, doesn't it? There's drunkards, there's covetous people, there's extortioners, there's all these people in the church. The church's main problem is that they could not disconnect themselves from the world. They could not de-Corinthianize themselves, okay? And so these reports are coming in. Paul is hearing of these reports. He hears of fighting among the brethren, of sexual sin, of confusion about relationships and marriage and disorder, and so... Paul gets so upset, he sends Timothy over there to investigate what's going on. There might have even been a brief visit by Paul himself. So you think about after after he writes this first lost letter, he receives a letter back asking for clarification. He hears reports. He sends Timothy. Paul sits down to write this letter, 1 Corinthians, probably around A.D. 54 to, to 56. And he's trying to attempt to set them straight morally and doctrinally. But before he begins to tackle that issue... I love where he begins. You're called to be saints. And then he reminds them of some of the blessings of being a saint, chief of which is grace. Look at verse four. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Christ Jesus. We have uh, received God's grace. You, he says, have received God's grace. What a privilege it is to be recipients of God's grace. In fact, he goes on to say that you have everything that you need. In verse 7, so you come short in no gift. You're not lacking anything, he says. Now, you might be wondering why a church that is doing so poorly (laughs) would be, uh, uh, that has all the gifts, how could they be doing so poorly, right? They're not lacking anything. Well, God's, he provides the gifts for us, but many times we don't necessarily utilize those gifts, do we? In the Corinthian church, they weren't utilizing them, or they were using them the wrong way, or they were seeking gifts they didn't have. And so there's a great bunch of disorder going on in there. In fact, the word gift is this word, charisma, right? That's derived from the word grace, charis. Charis. The English word, you've heard it, is charismatic. It comes from the plural word of the, use of the word here, charismata. The word refers to the endowment by God of, of gracious gifts to his people to minister to his church. That's what it refers to. It doesn't refer to some sort of extraordinary gifts that were only reserved for the super spiritual uh, people, the ones that were more advanced in faith. That would be what the charismatic movement would try to tell you. All believers, you and me, we've all been endowed by God with charismata. We don't need to pray for some additional spiritual blessing in order to be um, used by God to become effective. We just simply need to recognize that we have a gift. We come short in no gift, he says, and use those gifts. My point is, you weren't born spiritually incomplete. None of you were born physically incomplete, I hope, right? You weren't born and then wait, oh, I can't wait till that right ear develops, you know? Everyone has two, I can't wait to get my second one, right? We all have 10 toes, maybe, (laughs) right? But generally, we're born physically, we, we mature, but we're complete physically, the same spiritually. You're not born spiritually complete. You need to mature spiritually, but we're born complete. In fact, I want to remind you of Colossians 2, 10. Paul says, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. And so the presence of those gifts 
confirms Paul's testimony about Christ in them. That's what he says in verse 6. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, they believed Paul's testimony about Jesus Christ dying on the cross for their sins. But when was their belief confirmed? It was when they received the Holy Spirit, when they received those gifts. That's the mark of the presence of the, of the Holy Spirit, our lives, right? How, how do you know you have the Holy Spirit? You don't see him. How do we know? We know by the fruit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. But we also know by the spiritual gifts. They confirm that we indeed have the Holy Spirit. So Paul testifies to that here, okay? So now the Corinthian church, like many churches, they have all these problems. They got the Spirit, they're saved, they got gifts, but they have all these problems, and they have all the problems for the same reasons all other churches have problems. They're made up of people. If we could get rid of the people, the church would be great. We're just flawed, right? We're sinful people. We're fallen. And the reason is this, honestly, the Christian life, it's, it's hard, isn't it? Because there are two great obstacles that we have to overcome in our daily life, the world and the flesh. Those two things. We all battle those things in our life. The world is full of temptations, sinful uh, things, but I think at the heart of it, it's the human philosophy, the secular world view. It's man's way of thinking, man's way of behaving, and it's, it's, you know, it's before us all the time, isn't it? You just get bombarded all day long, every day, by secular worldview, and Christians, we're really swimming against the current, and it's very, very difficult to, to go the right direction when the world is constantly in our face. The other obstacle is our own flesh. You, you know, we have been given a new nature. We're new creations, right? We have a, a divine nature, but we haven't been given a new flesh. Not yet. We're still in the flesh. Paul struggled with that, right? So we have these two obstacles. We have the external, which is the world, and we have the internal, which is the flesh. So Paul is going to address these problems from those perspectives. That's just to kind of set this up, all right? And he's going to be dealing with the problem of division. There was division amongst the saints in Corinth and he was going to address the outward worldly influence that caused them to do that. So look at the word here in verse 10. Divisions is where he brings it up. I, I, plead you, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. Dissensions, uh, schisma is the word, it, it, you know, schisms. There's no, no, nothing separating you. He says, don't have any divisions, but what? Speak the same thing, he says. Teach the same thing. Affirm the same thing say the same thing. What is he talking about here? Here he's talking about doctrine. It's vastly important that the church be united on, on doctrinal uh, things like the gospel, <laughs> the church, the Bible, God, Jesus Christ, Christian living. There's nothing more confusing, right, to a seeker or to a non-believer uh, than, than the differing opinions and interpretations of the Christian faith. We've got to be united about those fundamental things. And what is Paul talking about here? Who is our teacher? Because we might have different pastors, different teachers. Who ultimately is our teacher? The Holy Spirit is your teacher. He guides us into all truth. And for a church to all speak the same thing, Paul means they should all really be having the same teaching spirit. That's the idea. It's the ideas of man and his opinions, the world, that bring in division. Division of doctrine do not come from the Holy Spirit. You can't say, oh, the Holy Spirit led me to this wrong. That's man doing that. That's the world's influence. The Holy Spirit guides us into truth. Now, why is this all so important? Unity. Unity. Because Paul says in, that, in, in verse 10, right, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Perfectly. Unified in doctrine. Unified in the application of it to the church. It's the doctrine, the, the truth and the application of it. Those two things he's addressing here. To have the same mind is to have the mind of Christ. He says that in chapter uh, 2. So it means to be united in our beliefs, in our standards, in our attitudes, in, in, our, in our principles of, of spiritual living. And it doesn't come through coercion. It comes through indoctrination by the Holy Spirit, through his truth. The Holy Spirit guides us into truth. So having the same mind refers to that internal, right? Have the same mind. Have the same judgment refers to the external. Here's how you apply it. 
So it's the application of the truth. So they have these divisions going on, divisions over doctrine. They also have divisions over leaders, leadership contentions taking place. Look at verse 11. For it's been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, or I'm of Christ, <laughs> right? Some people are saying, I follow this guy, I follow that guy. There's nothing wrong with having a special love um, and affection for a, a certain pastor or a certain leader. Maybe, maybe that person is the one that led you to Christ. Maybe they've been instrumental in your spiritual uh, growth or they had a huge impact in your faith. But the Corinthians, they were going one step further. They literally were beginning to identify themselves by the name of the person right, that they followed. So if you think back to the person, maybe there's a person that led you to Christ, it'd be like you walking around and saying, oh, I am a Bill, <laughs> right? What, what, what are we doing? How can we get there? How does that happen? Well, that's what people do. That's the world's influence. We elevate human leaders. We elevate human uh, people. So what's the solution here? Paul is so um, um, smart to, to kind of bring this into the focus on Christ. In verse 13, he says this, is Christ divided? Because you're divided. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul, he says? See, he's saying, you see what he's saying? Christ, he wasn't cut into pieces. He wasn't divided into factions and parties like they were beginning to do. And that's what was happening in the church. It wasn't just that they preferred, they were dividing over these leaders. His argument here centers on the fact that we are one in Christ. Here, we have a great example, right? We have two separate bodies that have been in the same city for a while. We've come together, but listen, we've always been one, right? It's not just now because we come into this building that we've been one. We've always been one. We're one body in Christ. A Christian church that is, is divided, that is a contradiction. We're one. Unity is so important. And the purpose of our unity as believers is to bring glory to God. That, and, and who's the source of all that? The source of the unity? Jesus Christ. Is Christ divided? No, he's not. He, what, what, he was the one crucified for you. He says, not Paul. When we baptize people, we baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, not in the name of Paul, <laughs> right? That's his point there. So then he, he focuses them on that issue of the cross, the cross of Christ. In verse 17, look at it. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Paul's point here rests upon the fact Christ just sent me to preach, not to baptize and then get a whole bunch of Paul followers, but he sent me to preach the gospel so that people will follow him. And the message of the cross that he focuses on is, is so important because he says, listen, if you want to talk about division, if you want to see division, there is something that divides. Look at the cross because the cross divides. In fact, look at verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. If you want a division, there's the great division. Paul divides the human race into two. Do you see it there? There's those that are perishing and those that are being saved. So he talks about divisions. Division doesn't exist in the church, but division exists in the world because it's the church and the world. There's those that are perishing and those that are being saved. We are saved, but we're also in the process of being saved, right? We haven't fully received our inheritance of salvation. That's what he's talking about. And so for the worldly wisdom to come in to the church here and elevate man's wisdom is, is, is crazy. When man's wisdom is reigning, then the wisdom of God just seems foolish to people. And that's what he kind of continues to talk about uh, in this whole section in chapter 1. The word, logos, is, is the, the, of, the, of the cross is that salvation is freely granted by God's grace to all. We, we don't earn it, right? We don't get it by human merit or by our intellect. Salvation is, is extended to all people, everyone, which levels the ground at the cross. And everyone comes to God through faith based upon the work of Jesus Christ. That's the message of the cross. And he says that's foolishness to man. It offends man's pride. Every false religious system bases man's acceptance by God according to human effort, human wisdom. But Paul says that thinking strips uh, the cross of its power. The power is in the cross, and human wisdom can't understand the cross. This whole section, he says, that just destroys human wisdom. Look at verse 19, for it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. The cross destroys human wisdom but it displays God's power. Look at verse 22, for Jews request a sign, Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block to the Greeks, a foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power 
of God and the wisdom of God. It also shows us that there's nothing worthy in ourselves, right? He talks about that in verse 26. But you're calling, brethren, not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, right? It's not, it's not the wise people of the earth that I went to collect. It's not the, the mighty people. Um, it has nothing to do with your worth. Ultimately, it's about the glory of God. And that's verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. The primary reason behind God's method of saving is that God would be glorified. No man will ever have any reason whatsoever to boast before God about their salvation. No one. Oh, God, you should have let me in. I knew it. You know, I look at all the stuff I did. No, we're never going to say that. And in chapter two, he starts to talk about that a little bit more, right? That it's not about our power. It strips us of the power. It focuses on the power of another. Verse five of chapter two says, your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's where our faith is. Ultimately, I trust in the power of God to save me, not the power of man, right? We're kind of forced to, you know, trust in the power of man to save us from this coronavirus right now. Like, like we're kind of, ultimately, I trust in the power of God for ultimate salvation. In fact, listen to what Charles Spurgeon said. The power that is in the gospel does not lie in the eloquence of the preacher. Otherwise, men would be the converter of souls. Nor does it lie in the preacher's learning. Otherwise, it would consist in the wisdom of men. We might preach until our tongues rotted, till we would exhaust our lungs and die, but never a soul would be converted unless the Holy Spirit be with the word of God to give it the power to convert the soul. Well said. So since Paul has brought up wisdom, he begins to expound on that here throughout chapter two because of, well, two reasons. It's such an important issue to the Greeks. They loved wisdom, but also it was the elevating a man's wisdom that brought on these uh, division. The divisions. Look at verse 6. He says, however, this is chapter 2, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. What does Paul mean here? That only the mature believers can understand God's wisdom? No. He says, it's not the wisdom of this age or this period of time or this historic period. It's not the, the, the rulers of this age. Look what he says in verse 7. But we speak the, mis- the, the wisdom of God in a mystery the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. The reason man does not know it's, it, doesn't know it, doesn't know God's wisdom is because it, it, it is not knowable to him. God has hidden it from him. God has chosen to do that. And the reason is it's outside of man's capacity to know. You have to come to God. You cannot discover God by some sort of human means human wisdom. And that's what he's saying here. It's, it's revealed to you, revealed to you. Now, here's the great question. I'm going to take a little bit of time because this is so basic and so fundamental to the Christian understanding. God's wisdom, hear me on this, is divinely revealed. You, you don't discover God on your own. It's divinely revealed because man is in a closed box. We, we are fixed. We are stuck in this natural world and we cannot sort of leap into and discover the supernatural. We discover it through three things, and Paul discusses them here, and these are uh, fundamental Christianity 101 things. So just point these out. I'm going to point these out to you, okay? Look at verse 10. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. The Holy Spirit is the agent of transmission and communication. The first thing we have to understand is revelation. God's wisdom, it, it comes to us through revelation. And the Holy Spirit does that. And the question is, well, why does God use the Holy Spirit to reveal truth? Why does it have to be the Holy Spirit? But look what he says uh, there, right? The Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of, of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. What he's saying is, no one knows you better than you, right? I may know you, but I don't know you better than you know you. You might know me, but you don't know me better than I know me. I might know my wife really well, but I still don't know her better than she knows her. Who knows God better than the spirit of the God that is in him? Do you see the point? So the spirit has to be the one to reveal truth. It cannot come by by some other outside means. The second thing, you want to write these down, Revelation, inspiration. Inspiration, verse 12. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. So look at what he said. We've received. We've received these things so that we might know these things. What is he saying here? Well, he's saying it was given. 
Who's the we? Paul and all the other writers of the New Testament. We had to receive it. It was pressed into their minds. The theological term is inspiration. It was, they were inspired. And the, really, it comes from 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. It's God's word that we believe to be inspired by God and not the writer's thoughts or opinions. And that is a basic principle, and really it's going to be really, really important that you understand that because even as we continue through 1 Corinthians, we're going to get to some really difficult passages, some really hard stuff. And you're going to be tempted. You're going to be tempted to say, well, that part, that's Paul's opinion. That's just his opinion. Listen, no, Paul never gives his opinion. He doesn't give his opinion. Why? All Scripture is God-breathed. Not some of it, not the parts that are just Paul's opinion. All Scripture is God-breathed. And what is it? Scripture. What is Scripture? The writing. So it's not just his thoughts. And it's, the right, it's the actual words that have been penned in our Bibles. Those are inspired by the Holy Spirit. That's inspiration. The third thing is illumination. Illumination. And that comes really in verse 14. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things. Yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct um, him? But we have the mind of Christ. The Holy Spirit takes God's revealed word, his inspired word. He illuminates to those in whom he dwells. That's the idea. Christians have the spirit. They are the spiritual man. So illumination then is for all Christians, not just the super spiritual Christians, right? All Christians, because we all have the spirit. So we can rightly understand and discern God's truth when we rely upon the truth giver, the natural man. Do you notice the natural man was mentioned there? He cannot rightly appraise or discern God's word. He's not, he doesn't have the spirit. He's not the spiritual man. He's the natural man. That's the, the natural man is the opposite of the spiritual man. That would be an unregenerate person, a non-believer, one who is devoid of the spirit. And so this is really the struggle. The Corinthians were struggling against both of those obstacles, right? Uh, Paul explained in, in really chapter 1 all the way to the end of chapter 2 here. They were divided because of the worldliness, uh, their love for human wisdom, because of the influence of uh, the world. And it's seeped in there, and it's kind of uh, seeped in through um, um, the, these, these people who are just really kind of spiritually de- devoid and immature. And now he's going to sort of look on the other obstacle as well, sort of the, the flesh uh, because we division also came in not just from outside means but from inside means because they're still in uh, sinful flesh and that's where chapter three really begins here look at verse one and i brethren could not speak to you as to spiritual people but as to carnal as to babes in christ so it wasn't just the external world that was the problem it was the internal but notice that he calls them brethren it's another clue that he's talking to fellow believers because they're in they're saved they're saints so what is paul saying here He's saying this, in spite of the fact that you're positionally spiritual, I can't talk to you as if you are spiritual. Yeah, I'd like to talk to you as if you were spiritual, but you just, you're not. You're, you're carnal. In fact, that word carnal, it just means fleshy. Fleshy ones is the literal word for it. So not positionally, again, but practically speaking, right? That's their practice. They're acting as if they are controlled by the flesh. He's saying, I've got to talk to you like you're carnal, like you're unsaved, like you're that natural man. And the question has been proposed, well, can you be carnal and still be a Christian? Well, yes. It just simply means you're being governed by the flesh and not by the spirit. In fact, notice, notice what he calls them, babes in Christ. You're a baby in Christ. That kind of clears it up, right? They're, they're in Christ, but they're just babes in Christ. And I want to clarify, this doesn't mean that they're just new believers. In fact, nowhere in the New Testament or in the Scripture do you, do you refer, uh, see babe referring to a new Christian. Now, you could do that, right? We could say, oh, they're just a babe in Christ because they're, they're, they're new. What does that mean when we say that? It just means they don't know that much yet. But nowhere in Scripture do we have that. Paul calls them babes here because they're spiritually ignorant. They're not young in the faith. They're just spiritually undeveloped. They have no excuse for that. It's not their IQ. Why? They love wisdom. It's not the lack of teaching. They sat under Paul's teaching for a year and a half. And after that, Apollos came and taught them. And scripture tells us he was an eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures, fervent in spirit, that he spoke and talked accurately the things of the Lord. So it's not because of lack of teaching. 
Now, the reason they were babes, the reason they remained in a state of spiritual ignorance after all this time is because they were carnal, he says, fleshly. They refused to give up their worldly ways. Babes in Christ are carnal Christians. You can't receive God's word. You can't just sit there and receive it and expect spiritual growth while remaining worldly. I see a lot of Christians hoping that will happen. It just doesn't happen that way. In fact, let me give you an example. I'll take you to 1 Peter 2.2. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. We all love that word. Ah, as newborn babes, I want to desire the pure milk of the word. That's great. We do. Now that's verse 2. To get to verse 2, you have to go to first verse 1, don't you? Well, here's verse 1 says. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word. You see that? What do they have to do first? You have to get rid of the flesh. You have to get rid of the flesh first. Lay all that aside, and then you're going to desire the pure milk of the word. It was John MacArthur that said, nothing causes us to ignore God's truth more than not living it. So true. You become like the man in James. You remember the forgetful hearer? When you hear God's word over and over and over, you just don't obey it. That's the man in James. And look what he says in verse 3. For you're still carnal. For where there are envy and strife and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? At the heart of Christians that are immature is self-centeredness. Selfishness is always the root of fleshly carnal behavior. Look at they were envious, right? Contentions, rivalry, jealousy, that's what that means. It's a symptom of carnal, immature believer. It's the inward attitude of the heart. It's the extreme form of selfishness. And Paul calls them babes in Christ. That's a great example, right? Selfishness is an obvious characteristic of a baby, right? A baby's only concerned with itself. But that's expected of a baby. But it's not expected of an adult, much less of a Christian adult. Yet we see Christians adults acting like babes. Selfishness is infantile. And when it's manifest in a Christian adult, it really betrays that they are carnal. In fact, he says the inner attitude of envy leads to the outward action of strife, those contentions, right? The wranglings that are going on. So the inner emotion leads to outward contention, and a contentious person is, is that way because they're selfish. And their selfishness has led to divisions. And these carnal, immature people cooperate only with the leaders and people with whom they happen to agree with or who personally maybe uh, appeal to them or flatter them, and that was happening in the church, right? That's why they were following those. These are my favorite. So what's the cure to all this? Well, everything you're going to see in the remaining verses, that's the the cure. The division has happened because eyes are on self. And Paul is trying to take their eyes off of self and put them on God. And that's what he begins to do here. He begins to say, hey, listen, we're we're nothing. You're dividing over leaders, but who are we? Look at verse 5. Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one. We're just ministers. In fact, the word ministers there is diakonos. It's where you get your word deacons. You guys have deacons here, right? I hope you know what that means. That means you're a waiter. (laughs) You're a servant. But that's what Paul says he is. I'm here to serve. I'm just a waiter. I'm just, I'm a lowly servant. Why are you elevating me? Don't get your eyes on me. Get your eyes on God. We're just here to serve. God used Paul and Apollos to be sure. But it's through them that they believed. uh, and, And they were just instruments. Yes, you can esteem them. Yes, you can love them for their work, but don't revere them. And so he starts to give a couple of metaphors. We'll go through these quickly just to enhance his teaching on this. He gives a farming metaphor, an agricultural metaphor in verse 6. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. See that? I mean, we both did a little bit of work, but ultimately the increase came uh, from God. Then he goes into construction in verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. Paul, Apollos, Peter, they're all ministers Um, they're all fellow workers with God. They're all working God's field. The church in Corinth was God's church, right? Paul and Apollos, they were just fellow workers with God. He says, you, you are his field. You, you are his building. And Paul, Paul was a master builder. And his primary task, he looked upon himself as the, as the primary one to, to lay the foundation, not design the foundation. That's different to lay the foundation. The foundation of biblical Christianity is who? Jesus Christ, right? And that's in verse 11. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Any church built on human philosophy or some religious system is doomed. 
it's going to fail because there's no suitable foundation. It has to be built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And if it isn't, it's not really a church. So how important is the foundation? When you think about you lay a foundation, right, if it's just off a little bit and you get down the ways, it's really hard to correct that. It's got to be right when you start. God's kingdom is built upon Jesus Christ. Everyone must build on that foundation alone or the building will be doomed for failure. Now, this, he goes into a very interesting thing, but he, here's how it ties in. Now, you all can be built, we all can be building on that foundation. We're all building on the foundation of Jesus Christ. All of us. It's not just the Apollos of this world. It's not just the, 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 you know, sort of the spiritual elite. We all build on that foundation, but some of us can build in an unworthy manner. In verses 12 to 13, he talks about what's known as the judgment seat of the believers, the Bema seat judgment, where we will be judged for our works, what we've done in Christ, not a judgment of condemnation, but a, a rewards. And he begins to talk about that. He says, if anyone builds, this is verse 12, on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. Now, you have Christians here looking at the foundation of Jesus. They come to build and some come with gold and silver and precious stones. The Corinthians were coming with wood, hay, straw. Do you see? Now, I want to be clear about something. These materials, they don't represent material wealth. It's not that the rich are going to be able to build and your finances somehow limit your ability to build. That's not what he's talking about here. Nor do they represent your talents like your spiritual uh, gifts because the Lord gives to each one and he sees fit. It's not even opportunity as if maybe some have the opportunity to build and others don't. No, all believers are building something. We all are. Because the materials represent our response to Christ. How well we serve the Lord. In other words, hang on to your seats. They represent our works. Now listen, we're not saved by works. For by grace you've been saved through faith, right? And that out of yourselves. It's the gift of God, lest no one should boast, right? But what's verse 10 say? But we are all created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. It's the works that, that, um, that we, we bring to our Heavenly Father because we want to serve Him. Gold, silver, precious stones, those are the best materials. Wood, hay, straw, those are the poorest materials. And the fire is going to reveal what will stand. Gold, silver, precious stones, they'll be there. What about the wood, hay, straw? Probably not much left. So the materials themselves, they're not sinful. All of them can be used to build something. Eeyore had a wood little hut, didn't he? You don't say Eeyore here, you say something else. Um, but not all of them are valued the same way, are they? Some are building with hay, but they think they're building with silver. We've got to check what we're building with. And the reason is they've created their own criteria for how the Lord evaluates their work. The Lord, he, he evaluates what we built on his own criteria. His, his criteria is right motives, right conduct, effective service. He's, he wants the motive to be right in the heart. So his whole point here, why are we boasting in men? What are you building on? What are you doing? Who should we boast about? Verse 21, therefore let no one boast in men for all things are yours. <laughs> Right? You're dividing over leaders, and they all teach the same word of God. Listen, Paul, Apollos, Cephas, who is Peter, Christ, they all taught the same thing. They weren't teaching different doctrines as if they were opposed in doctrine. The people were following them, creating their own things. But we all have the same doctrine. If you have teachers that are all teaching the same thing, why do you divide and follow certain ones? They're all yours. All things are yours in Christ. All of them are. So to conclude, Paul, Paul is going to come back to himself, but don't worry, we're going to wrap this up quick. I'm just going to touch on chapter 4. He's going to bring back himself as an example because he was nothing more than a servant and a steward in verse one of chapter four let a man so consider us as servants of christ stewards of the mysteries of god we're, we're just we're just servants here we're just waiters right he also submits the the example of the apostles a good example as well what about them I mean, we could venerate all of them but but in verse nine for i think that god has displayed us the apostles last as men condemned to death for we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. And look at all these words he uses. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. To the present hour, we both hunger and thirst. We're poorly clothed, beaten, homeless. We labor, working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. We've been made as the filth of the world and the offscouring of all things until now. The world is, looks at us as low, as nothing. 
but we know how God looks upon us. It's, it's how we serve him, and they served him through all of that. He then finishes with just some very personal paternal words. In verse 14, he says, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. He had begotten them. He had led them to Christ. He had started the church in Corinth. He was their spiritual father. Some of you are spiritual fathers or mothers to others, right? If you've led them to Christ, you're sort of a spiritual father to them. And here we have a great example of discipleship. As a spiritual father, he acts like one to them. He loves them. Verse 14, he talks about that. He warns them in verse 14. He sets an example for them in verses 16 and 17. He teaches them in 17 as well, but he also disciplines them. I like all the other parts. I don't so much like the discipline part, but all those are parts of being a father and parts of being a spiritual father. So he leaves them with a choice at the very end. He says, what do you want? Verse 21, what do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love and a spirit of gentleness? Well, you can tell by his letter which one he prefers to come with, right? Because he loves them. See, the church is, is going a little wayward, they're believers, they're just operating in the flesh, they succumb to their flesh, they succumb to the world, and he is a father correcting them and said, listen, I, I would just love you to see you repent and I'll come to you with gentleness, but if you don't, then I'm coming with a rod and he'll have to, to use that. And that's a difficult thing. And he's going to go on to this church and talk about some difficult things and next week we will all dive in to see what is he going to address here in chapter 5 because some, some terrible things are starting to be accepted in the church and they haven't repented. And so he's going to have to address those things, but he, he still does it. He still does it in the spirit of a father. So, so don't, don't miss next week. Join us for that. Let me just close in prayer. God, thank you so much for your word today. We thank you for the Holy Spirit's illumination today. I pray that you were guiding your people into truth. Lord, I know this was sort of a fire hose uh, today going through four chapters, but Lord, I, I just trust your spirit to, Lord, uh, to impart to each one of us what you think we each need to hear and to go home and away with. So we trust you in that, Lord. I hope you were glorified. We just praise you again for this time. And Lord, we just love you and thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.